great, because I hate podiums like nobody's business. So my name is Casey Zakoff. I'm in the MIT Wood Solution and Graphic Joint Program. So I'm our one representative from Hui down here. And that's not Hui down the street. That's Hui up the road at the other place. Um, and so I'm here talking about uh, what we know about how cephalopods might do under climate change. And uh, just want to say thank you to Tony for getting these talks together and all the great speakers who, like Bowen and, and Dana and others, have set up this talk so I didn't have to explain all that much because you guys have been really comprehensive. Uh, in fact, Dana basically kind of spoiled the ending to my talk, which is just like, but no, you made me restructure it and now it's fun. Um, so, it is, um, yeah, cephalopods, as far as we know from these fisheries and survey data, appear to be doing pretty well. And this is based on the standardized metrics of abundance, and this is a com combination of fishery data over the last 50 years as well as survey data. But the thing that I want to point out about this and what it sort of says is there's 14 species of demersal uh, sets, there's 38 species of epipelagic, 15 of pelagic here. There are 800 at least species of cephalopods in the world. This is a very small sort of subsample of those that we're making a broad generalization about. And that's kind of how my job works. Um, so, you know, cephalopod research is limited to what we have access to. It's just sort of the nature of the beast. I work with our local squid, or which is BLI. Um, a lot of the physiology work that's necessary to understand how these taxa are going to respond to climate change has to be done by the few organisms we can actually get a hold of or model organisms when that comes about. So squid, octopus, uh, cuttlefish, sepiolids, and uh, pygmy squid, hooray, we can really study those and are learning this, like, much more about them very comprehensively. So when I'm talking about cephalopods and climate change today, most of the research is on these guys and the physiology we're talking about is these guys, and therefore we're not talking about things that are weird and do different things like nautilus, or things that we really know very little about because they're really deep, like the giant squids, or things in really unique environments like Antarctic octopuses. And these guys may be an intense threat as a result of climate change, but we just don't know enough about their ecology and physiology to make too many broad sweeping statements. And the other aspect of cephalopod stress physiology, which is my focus, is that because we can't really keep them alive super long, particularly the squid, like we're limited to short-term experiments right now. So I work with the squid here, and it's easy to get the adults from MBL and do physiological studies of them in the short term. It's easy to get the eggs and do physiological studies of them in the short term, and we can raise those to paralarvae, and that's cool, but like getting them from paralarvae to adults is very challenging done, but challenging, and you know, it's really thanks to Brett and Taylor and their work that with other potential model organisms, we'll be able to kind of close this loop and start asking the kinds of questions about generational, you know, epigenetic effects and how we can study them. But right now, there's a lot of missing information, so we're really biased to understanding how adults will respond and how embryos will respond, and not a lot in between, um, just by the nature of the, the aquatics. Um, so, carbon dioxide is our driving force of climate change. Um, carbon dioxide is this carbon double bonded to two oxygen molecules. And the thing that I really want to point out as someone who works tangential to climate change is people think about climate, they think about either weather over the long term, they think about the atmosphere, and that's just not what you need to be thinking about. You need to be thinking about the ocean. The ocean is the thing that controls our climate. It is so deeply involved in the climate, and if the first thing that doesn't come to your mind when you hear the word climate is ocean, we have a problem. So, carbon dioxide affects the ocean in multiple ways. It is driving warming, uh, and this is a well-established thing that I will go through the science of momentarily. Warming is causing the oxygenation, and then carbon dioxide separately causes an effect called ocean acidification, and this is something we're very concerned about in terms of calcifying organisms but also for um, basically anything in the ocean because it can really impact physiology in a number of interesting ways that I'll talk about. And that's what I focus on in raising squid eggs under levels of ocean acidification and seeing what they, what they do. But these are our broad how carbon dioxide is doing stuff problems. Now, the other sort of thing to know when it comes to climate change and the big sort of backlash we'll get is the climate changes as a natural occurrence in the world, carbon dioxide uh, concentrations have fluctuated before, like none of this is new. And the thing that's different 
now, because humans are putting out so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, is the rate. Like, it's not that the world couldn't deal with this much carbon dioxide over geologic time. Yes, carbon dioxide has buried quite a lot, and yes, the climate has changed, temperatures have changed, but it is happening so fast and so sharply that we don't believe that most organisms are going to be able to keep up, that most ecologies are going to be able to adapt rapidly enough. So the rate of change is the thing that's really the key to the driving concern about climate change. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about physics. I will get to cephalopods at some point, I swear. Um, and this is just sort of a basic understanding of how uh, energy and matter interact. And so if you think of energy, and in this case we're talking about like solar radiation, light, electromagnetic radiation, when it interacts with matter, it can do a couple things. And so matter, we're talking about anything that's made of molecules or atoms, or and atoms, atoms made of molecules, um, that energy can hit that matter and be absorbed. So light can hit something, and then that thing absorbs that light, or some of it, and reflects into the back, and then we see color, or it absorbs all of it, and it's black, and it's hotter, right? <coughs> okay. Uh, that energy can pass through matter, and that's transmission, so it's going through, you know, light is going through this air right now, it's being transmitted, it's not uh, getting changed as it passes through the oxygen molecules in the room, or it can be emitted from that matter, so it can be absorbed into a molecule and then changed. This energy can't be created or destroyed, but the form of it can change. So if we start with light, and we think about like asphalt hitting up a sidewalk, that, or hitting up a, a street, that's light hitting a black surface, the light is getting absorbed, and then it's emitting uh, a new form of energy, which is heat. So that, that's a change in that structure, or it's trying to change the structure, energy. So how this relates to climate change is we have the sun, and it is radiating electromagnetic radiation onto the earth, primarily in visible and invisible spectra of light. And so it hits the earth, and like that asphalt, the earth heats up. Uh, I will back up, as I just noted, like there's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that that light is passing through, right? And it's interacting with that, but for the most part, carbon dioxide transmits light, right? So we don't see carbon dioxide, otherwise we'd live in the darkness. Um, but when that light hits the earth, it heats up the earth, and the earth sends back radiation in the form of heat. And that also interacts with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It also interacts with water vapor and methane and other greenhouse gases, which is a terrible metaphor, but I don't <laughs> um, and in this form, it gets absorbed, and then it gets re-emitted. Uh, so some of it is sent back out into space, and some of it is retained on the Earth. And this is the reason why our planet is warm, and it's sustained light, so it's very nice. But if you increase the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere, you would increase the same amount of radiation still being emitted from the, the Earth due to the solar radiation, but now you've increased the amount that's being absorbed in the atmosphere, and you're increasing the amount that's being retained rather than being sent back into space. And that is why the planet is warming. That is as simple as I could make that, so I hope that worked. Um, now, oftentimes when you see graphs like this, they really focus on the Earth and terrestrial things, and that's what we deal with. But that's not most of the world. Most of the world is the ocean. The ocean is what matters here. The ocean is taking up more than 90% of that heat. Uh, so the ocean is warming very rapidly. Uh, we don't see a lot of that because it's getting sequestered to depth, but eventually it will all come back. We'll be long dead by then, but like that will be something for future generations to deal with because all that heat is coming back. Um, so the key thing here is climate change is ocean change. When you think about that term, I really want you to first and foremost think about the ocean. Climate and the ocean are inexorably linked. And so, ocean animals are a really primary concern here. The ocean is warming. What does that mean for cephalopods? And again, I don't have to explain this too much because Alan did it for me. But, and and uh, Barrett did it for me. Um, so the cephalopod groups that we're talking about, right, these live fast, die young, you know, Cephs, the lolliganids, the homostrephids, octopus and such, they have high metabolic rates, high oxygen consumption rates. They are very, very active and theoretically living on the limits of, of biology, right? It's not like these guys that are deep and slow, but these guys that are living 
you know, really at the edge of things that we're concerned about because temperature as their invertebrates affects their metabolic rate and really pumps it up. So they're potentially getting stressed out and hitting sort of the maximum of, of their metabolism. And as Ellen, I think, also pointed out, um, it affects the rate of development and can affect size at maturity and age of maturity. And it really creates this variable life cycle situation for cephalopods where varying temperatures can result in very different life cycles for, for squid at the very least. Uh, so it's a really important uh, variable to consider. Again, Owen like, beat me to the punch on this and I'm so okay with that. But uh, this is a map of sea surface temperatures and just those warmer colors mean warmer places and those, especially in the sort of shallow layers of the ocean are going to be expanding. Um, if your cephalopods are constrained by temperature, if their habitat space is constrained by temperature, most cephalopods are very mobile. They can either move along the benthos or move through the flagos. And so, yeah, they're moving latitudinally away from the equator, where they're moving towards cooler waters. So those events of the Dory to the Pele coming up to Maine and Basidicus moving up the California coast are potentially driven by this habitat range shift as a result of them moving with their sort of temperature window in the ocean. Okay. The other aspect of warming is that it affects the solubility of the ocean. So this is getting into how much gas the ocean can contain. And so the metaphor we're gonna use here is this nice, cool, refreshing glass of soda. And hopefully most of you have experienced this before. Soda is packed with carbon dioxide. It's what gives it, what gives it its fizz. It's a lot of zzz in that sentence. Um, and when it's cold, all that carbon dioxide is in the soda itself. And some of it is off-gassing now that it's been released from pressurization, but if you were just to leave that and let it warm up, that carbon dioxide would begin to escape into the air as the warming soda, uh, well A, equilibrates with the atmosphere, but B, also cannot hold as much carbon dioxide, so you have this warmed, flat soda. So what this means for an ocean that's getting warmer is that it can't hold as much oxygen, can't hold as much other dissolved gases. Now, you may say, hey, does this mean it can't hold as much carbon dioxide? The rate at which carbon dioxide is increasing in the atmosphere is far larger than this process. So that's going to get overwhelmed by the equilibration of just how much more carbon dioxide is being added to the atmosphere in the first place. Oxygen is driven by other processes, so that's why this is more directly affecting oxygen. Um, the other process affecting oxygen is aerobic respiration. So this is a profile of oxygen in the ocean. So these are transects. The north, the top here is the Atlantic Ocean, and then the bottom here is the Pacific. So we're just going longitudinally straight across the North Atlantic. And then we have depth, and the uh, warmer colors are oxygenated waters, and the cooler colors are deoxygenated waters. And what we have are these, is this the laser? Yay. Um, purple bands in both of these cases, these are what's known as the oxygen minimum zone in the ocean. So uh, production in the ocean happens at the surface. That's where you get that mixture of light that allows photosynthesis to occur and nutrients that are being upwelled. All of that production, all that material, all that food sinks down, uh, being eaten by all the things we care about, but eventually hits a layer of uh, heterotrophic bacteria that respire it, essentially. Uh, and so just like us, when we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out carbon dioxide, that's how uh, aerobic respiration works. Basically, there's a layer of like bacteria and things that just eat all the detritus from the surface ocean and respire so much that they take out all the oxygen from this layer of the ocean. Uh, some organisms can use this as refuge, uh, things that can hold their breath, things that uh, can uh, Primarily hold their breath. Um, but um, A, because the temperature is increasing and aerobic respiration of invertebrates is driven by temperature, that means that this aerobic respiration is increasing, so they're going to burn up more of the available oxygen. Uh, B, uh, 
No, that's pretty much it. So basically, the, uh, I'm sorry, my brain's a little tired today. The, the intent here is that these bands are going to get wider, and as a result, A, you're going to have a constraint in habitat. So the animals that we care about, these squid that have, or pelagic uh, cephalopods that are burning the midnight oil at their high metabolic rates, are constrained to places where there's good oxygenation, and then as these bands increase, their habitat space in the vertical is decreasing. So that's a concern. Uh, some squid, like Pacificus gigas, the Humboldts, actually can like dive into these spaces to attack uh, fishes that like to hide in these zones. Um, and what they can do, I already talked about the fact that the squid has a high oxygen demand, covered that, good job me, is slow down their metabolism. So on the x-axis here, you see the amount of exposure to a hypoxic zone, so a place of low oxygen, like one of these oxygen minimum zones. Uh, and the only line that I particularly want you to care about is ATP consumption rate, which is just our metric of metabolism. And the uh, thing that Brad Seibel really looks at is that these animals can, when they're exposed to hypoxia for long periods, basically just bring down their metabolism. They suppress their, their just burning of their available energy stores until they move back out of the hypoxic regions. And so that's A, good, because you can like dive in, kind of chill out, and then come back. Uh, you can use that to your advantage if you want to. Um, but B, also kind of rough, if those environments are becoming larger and they have to uh, suppress their metabolism for longer, so that might affect them ecologically. So in all of these cases, we're talking about, you know, potential stressors and potential opportunities for these cephalopods to deal. Um, my focus is ocean acidification, uh, which is a completely separate process. So if people are like, climate change isn't real, you can say, right, but we should still curb carbon emissions because ocean acidification. Because it is a completely separate thing where because atmospheric carbon dioxide is increasing, it is equilibrating into the water, and we have a chemical reaction that occurs between carbon dioxide and water that produces this carbonic acid, right? And so we're increasing the acidity of the ocean, we're dropping the pH, uh, which is just a measure of uh, how many of these hydrogen ions are in our ocean, right? Um, so this is a concern for corals, this is a concern for shellfish, but it's a concern for cephalopods too, um, because it not only affects calcification, but it can affect a couple of other systems as well. I wanted to prove that this was real, so I put in a graph. Uh, cool. Uh, <laughs> this is my improv skills at hand. Uh, so this is the Mauna Loa record, and this just shows that these changes have been observed. This is another thing that as a climate change scientist you get a lot. It's like, well, we haven't seen this in reality, though. No, this has been measured, right? Carbon dioxide on the red here has been increasing at Mauna Loa. The yellow is our aquatic equilibration of carbon dioxide in the water, and our blue is the pH of that water. So that's becoming more acidic as the pH decreases. So this process has been observed in nature. It is happening, and it is happening rapidly. Happening rapidly enough that we can see it. Um, but right, so cephalopods have a couple systems that we're concerned about in terms of the pH. Um, we've heard about their blood pigment already. Uh, so the hemocyanin can carry less blood. There's a whole deal with that Bohr effect. Essentially, it's a very pH sensitive uh, pigment, so it's just we're concerned that squid and other cephalopods won't be able to carry as much oxygen in their blood as a result of an increased environmental pH. There's some more recent work done by Seibel and his group that I don't think is out yet, so I won't spoil too much of his stuff, that indicates that probably they're still okay, that they can still operate, but um, it's a concern. My studies have looked at statolids as a calcifying structure, so statolids are at the back of squid's head, they're uh, elsewhere in the head and other cephalopods, but, uh, and they're a balance and orientation structure, but these are stones, like the size of a grain of dust, essentially. Um, made of calcium carbonate, you can see we can raise our squid embryos under ambient conditions and they turn out nice and fine and low weight and good. And if we raise them under like very high acidification conditions, we get degraded surfaces and we get smaller sizes. Uh, a lot of what I was trying to do in my work was see if this also translated to a change in their ability to sense their environment and a change in their ability to swim. Things did not necessarily work out for me to answer those questions for reasons I'll get into in a minute. Um, however, people who work with pygmy squid have raised the adults in acidification, 
and seeing that rather than this, which is sensory reception, acidification can also affect sensory interpretation. So they can still see their environment and sense their environment, but they're behaving differently as a result of the acidification. That seems to be, at least from, we know, from what we know of fishes, an impact through their neurologic systems and something about the way their neurotransmitters uh, operate. Um, but the pygmy squid change the way they predate and change the way they respond to predators under acidification. So that's a concern as well. Um, so how do you respond to this, right? Like this is a challenging thing to uh, deal with physiologically. And again, uh, I think Greg probably summed it up best in terms of, well, you just have a ton of babies and you make them super plastic and somebody will survive. Um, that's a really big cephalopod strategy, except for the Nautilus. Oh God. Um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so this is actually data from my work. Uh, on the x-axis here, you have concentration of carbon dioxide. So this just means that you're going to the right. Acidification is increasing. Uh, this is three trials of experimental data from uh, 2013. On the top here is the surface area of our stabilids, so how large they are. Uh, and then on the bottom here is the dorsal mantle length of the parallelity, so just the size of that parallel uh, mantle as a metric of their growth. And you can see that in all, uh, pretty much all trials, there is a decrease in both of these metrics as a result of acidification. So we have individual trials here and then our compiled trends at the end. But you can also see that there's substantial variability in the response intensity from trial to trial. And like in this trial, the stabilites didn't get smaller at all and they barely got smaller uh, parallel wise as well. So. From clutch to clutch or throughout the season, we think that there's some difference in the ability of these organisms to respond to this stress, whether that's a difference in parentage or just environmental exposure or, or what, I don't have enough data to really robustly say, but we can say that there's some form of interseasonal variability uh, in terms of their response to this, and this is a advantage because it means that of the population, some group of them are probably going to do pretty good regardless of the stressor. The other note is because this is 2013 data, I did this work for four years, um, and in 2014 and 2015, these things didn't respond at all. All the way up to the highest acidification level, they were the same size, there was no degradation of status at all. And so there's also, as Owen pointed out, a potential interannual variability in their stress response. So there's another sort of scale of plasticity. There may be environmental factors that are affecting these year class populations because they're turning over so fast that gives them the potential to adapt to stressors quite rapidly. And these are the things that I'm teasing out as part of my thesis. So I'm defending in December, January. If you're around, come see that. Um, you know, that's the best time to be able to talk. Um, but that brings us back to where we began, which is, as Dan pointed out in her talk, that as far as we know, cephalopods, this particular group of them, are well built to deal with rapid change. They're one of the few organisms in the ocean that have really high fecundity, it means they produce a lot of babies, and their life cycle is so quick, they turn over so much, that we expect that they're going to be able to adapt to these stressors relatively quickly, as opposed to like long-lived fishes or the 20 year slow breezy novelists. Um, you know, these animals are built to deal with and have dealt with over geologic time rapid, drastic change. So, in terms of management of our fisheries and thinking about what organisms are going to win and which ones are going to lose, things look promising for cephalopods, which is good for everybody in this room. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm ending it there. <laughs> So the, no, I use flow-through system. 
I'm just going to just tell him I'm just supposed to okay. So it's all meaning it's on water, but I've treated it on a map that I've become on the certified. So it's unlikely that there's trace metal variability unless you've been seeing that in vineyards on water. I don't know about that fact. Um, okay, please. <laughs> because I argued that for like the first year and a half of my PhD, and they all told me it was impossible. So that's how it's there on your Follow him on Twitter, by the way, he's great. Okay. All right, thank you. Go, go for it. Um, all right, so I'm Eric Edsinger. I'm a postdoc research fellow, kind of gray area researcher here at the MBRL. And um, I was supposed to give a talk on octocan or culturing systems, but then we're going to go do a tour on that after this. So then I was going to give a talk, you know, like last night when I was thinking about it on why our cephalopod ate so big, and that's like a real research story. Like we had a brilliant high school student, and she did this amazing project on jet propulsion and egg size. Um, so that's one talk that I can give. Or uh, there is this uh, issue raised by Roger, and there's been kind of a theme through the different science talks about uh, whatever, at least in the research community, what people are really excited about, which is the development of kind of lab models, cephalopod lab models for research. And so I'll give this talk, because it's the one I can just kind of, I could stand in the corner and do it without my computer. And if you're interested in jet propulsion, um, it's a really cool story. I can tell you about it. We broke jet propulsion, and we think it has implications in terms of the loss of spiral cleavage, the evolution of bilateral 